In March of 2019, a young woman named Megan walked into the Maricopa Police Department with a disturbing story to tell. Her mother, 47-year-old Michelle Hobson, had been doing horrific, unimaginable things to Megan's seven adopted siblings. But what made the situation even crazier is that this family had a large online presence. The seven children were the stars of a very popular YouTube family channel called Fantastic Adventures, and Michelle Hobson was the puppet master behind the scenes. With nearly 1 million subscribers and quickly growing, the Fantastic Adventures channel was extremely successful, and Michelle was pulling in several thousands of dollars per month. She was living the good life, but her seven adopted children were living a nightmare. Hey everyone, welcome or welcome back to my channel. I hope everyone is doing well. If you are new here, my name is Summer Sanchez, and on this channel we talk about crime, cults, and heinous history. So if that sounds interesting to you, please consider subscribing and turning on notifications so you never miss an upload. We are obviously going to be talking about some very heavy stuff in this one. I will be including some of the body cam and interview footage, and I will also be including clips from the Fantastic Adventures YouTube channel, but I will make sure that the clips I use have the kids' faces blurred out, and I will also not be using any names as far as the children go. Their identities are protected, and of course we want to make sure that they remain protected. And with all of that being said, before we get into the case, let's go ahead and briefly talk about today's sponsor. This video is sponsored by Wild Grain. I think that I can speak for a majority of the population when I say that bread is the best. From cinnamon rolls to donuts to sourdough bread, I just love bread. But the stuff that I usually get from the grocery store isn't always the freshest, and that's why I was so excited when Wild Grain wanted to partner with me. Wild Grain is the first ever Bake From Frozen subscription box delivering hand-cut pastas, pastries, and sourdough breads directly to your door. They scour the country partnering with small bakeries and pasta makers so you know that you're also supporting small businesses. They offer a variety of delicious bread items that can be baked in 25 minutes or less with no thawing needed, which is perfect for like a weeknight meal when you're really busy, you don't have time to wait for bread to thaw out. This is what was in my wild grain box this month. I got the giant chocolate chunk cookies, the croissants, slow fermented olive oil ciabatta and brioche rolls, sourdough bread, and I also got some fresh cut fettuccine and tonarelli noodles. I've actually already used both packs of noodles and the croissants, which I forgot to get footage of, but today I'm baking the sourdough bread just as a snack. It's not even for dinner or anything, I just felt like having some bread. I took the bread directly out of the freezer, popped it into the oven, and within about 20 minutes, I had delicious fresh sourdough bread. The bread is absolutely delicious and my house smells so good. I think the next thing I wanna try is the maple Belgian waffles. They look amazing. Plus I just love breakfast food. I could eat breakfast food for all three meals. I also like that Wild Grain donates meals to the Greater Boston Food Bank. They've already donated donated half a million meals. And you can get started with your own Wild Grain subscription by clicking the link in the description box or go to wildgrain.com summer and use my code summer to get $30 off your first box. Plus you'll also get free croissants in every box for life. Thanks again to Wild Grain for sponsoring this video. And now let's get into today's case. Michelle Hobson's early life is a bit of a mystery. In fact, I don't even have a birthday for her. I think she was born in 1971 in Arizona, but even that I'm not 100% on. We don't know anything about her home life, her parents, her upbringing. As of right now, Michelle Hobson is still a total mystery. But we do know that she was well-liked in high school. According to her ex-husband, she was smart, she was popular, she was outgoing, and that's all we really know. So now we are jumping ahead to the mid 1990s and Michelle is now in her mid 20s. And this is when she meets a man named Gino Valerio. Gino and Michelle actually attended the same high school, but they didn't really know each other. They knew like of each other, but they weren't friends. They didn't hang around the same crowd. Gino has said that he was in the nerdy crowd and Michelle was in the popular crowd. And so they knew of each other, but that was really it. After high school, Gino went into the Marines and when he came back, he was struggling. He suffered from PTSD and addiction. He was just sort of floating aimlessly through life. You know, he was struggling. And then a friend offered to set him up on a blind date with a woman. And that woman just so happened to be Michelle Hobson, the popular outgoing girl that he recognized from high school. Michelle and Gino hit it off. Michelle helped Gino get the help that he needed to deal with his PTSD. She helped to get him clean. She helped him find a job. She really motivated Gino to turn his life completely around. And that's exactly what he did. And so their relationship 
relationship got more and more serious as time went on. Then about a year into their relationship, Michelle found out that she was pregnant. Now the relationship was going really well at this point, so they were probably gonna get married anyways. So this pregnancy just sort of sped things up a bit. So in 1995, Michelle and Gino got married, but something really strange happened the day of the wedding. So the morning of the ceremony, Gino noticed that there were two little boys hanging around Michelle, two kids that he had never seen before. So he asked her, you know, who are these two little boys? And she says, well, these are my sons. Now, Michelle and Gino had been together for at least a year at this point, And she had never once mentioned that she had any kids. He had no clue that these boys even existed until that moment, right after their wedding ceremony. And it was also in that moment that he found out that Michelle had an ex-husband. She had been married before and the two little boys were being raised by her ex-husband. Gino later found out that Michelle would hide any evidence of her children before he came over to her house. So like she would take photos off the walls, she would hide clothing and toys, basically any trace of the children, she would make sure that she pretty much wiped it from her house. She removed any trace of her children so that Gino wouldn't find out about them. And it's not really known why Michelle was so secretive about her life before she met Gino, but my guess is that maybe there were some skeletons in her closet that maybe she didn't want Gino to know about. Maybe she was worried he would start asking questions. The kids were in the primary custody of their dad. So did something happen that caused Michelle to lose custody? I don't know. But as shocking as this discovery was, Gino stayed with Michelle. He was just so grateful that she pulled him out of his depression and out of his addiction and helped him to turn his life around. And plus they were having a baby together. So Gino chose to stay. They ended up having a baby girl and I think they were living in Nevada at this point. So they just basically settled into life. And for a while, things seemed totally fine. But as the years went by, Michelle started to show her true colors. She became extremely controlling. She was manipulative. She was constantly watching over Gino's every move. He had to ask permission to do basically anything. And Gino just finally had enough. And so they ended up getting a divorce. Michelle took custody of their daughter. And according to Gino, Michelle told their daughter not to speak to him, like basically threatened her that she better not ever speak to her father. She essentially cut off all communication between him and their daughter. Even though Michelle Hobson is a mystery, you can kind of put little bits and pieces of her life together and it paints a picture of a very controlling person, a very manipulative person. Michelle seems to need control over every person in her orbit and you will definitely see more of what I mean as we get more into this case. So we only have pieces of the timeline between the time that Michelle and Gino divorce and the start of the Fantastic Adventures YouTube channel in 2012. We know that after the divorce, Michelle gets married to another man and also has another daughter. So now she has two sons and two daughters. She and the new husband, who I don't even have a name for, they eventually divorce or maybe he passed away. I don't know, but somehow the relationship ends and Michelle moves to Arizona. And it's in Arizona that the rest of this case takes place. Once she she settled in Arizona, Michelle decided that she wanted to foster young children. Michelle went on to foster several young children over the years. One source had her fostering at least 14 kids over the years, but she ultimately went on to legally adopt seven children. And because now Michelle was part of the foster care system, she became very well known to the local DCS. DCS had to vet her. She was required to go through a rigorous background check. They had to do a home study. They had to make sure that, you know, this was a good home for these children to come into. And Michelle wasn't just interested in fostering children. Her ultimate goal was to adopt these kids. According to the Arizona Child Welfare website, when a person is fostering to adopt, a caseworker is supposed to come to the home every two months to interview the child separately from the parents. And they're also supposed to interview all the other people living in the home. And if the child has any developmental difficulties or anything like that, a caseworker is supposed to come to the home every single month. And you will see that DCS completely failed every single one of these children. All of these children were subjected to years of abuse and torture at the hands of Michelle Hobson. And Michelle was very strategic with the children that she chose to adopt. She specifically sought out kids who had some sort of issue, whether it be a learning disability, a behavioral issue, emotional problems, the ones who were struggling in some way. Now, because we don't have any details about any of the children, we don't know exactly when each of them were adopted by Michelle, but we do know that when this case broke in 2019, she had seven adopted children, with the oldest being between the ages of 13 and 15 and the youngest being only two years old. And Michelle, you know, she saw herself as like a savior or something for taking in these children that 
most other families were reluctant to take in. She would brag to anyone and everyone about how great she was for helping these children who were disadvantaged in some way. She would like talk to friends and coworkers about the kids and she would paint herself as like a super mom. Like she was the greatest mom in the world. If Michelle had adopted these children for the right reasons because she actually wanted to give them a good home life and wanted to love them, that's fine then. I mean, still don't brag about how great you are, but you know what I mean. If she was actually doing this for the right reasons, then I think most people would look at her as this really amazing person. But Michelle's intentions were just absolutely disturbing, to put it mildly. She was choosing to adopt children who had some prior history of behavioral or learning issues because it would be easier for her to explain away any allegations that might pop up later down the road. So like if the child eventually did accuse Michelle of abuse, she could say, well, who are you going to believe? Are you going to believe like an upstanding citizen, a super mom who took in all of these troubled kids out of the kindness of my own heart, or this kid who's been in and out of the foster system with a prior history of issues. She thought that it would be much easier for her to get away with whatever sinister thing she wanted to do as long as she made sure to target the more vulnerable kids. Michelle was getting money from the state for each of these children. If you adopt a child who is classified as a special needs child, like most, if not all of Michelle's kids were, you get an even larger check. So some sources have reported that Michelle was receiving at least $5,000 per month from the state. And just keep in mind that Michelle does have four biological children as well. The two daughters live with her in Arizona. And at some point, her two sons, Ryan and Logan Hackney from her first marriage, they also come and live with her in Arizona. So she's got a full house. And once her foster kids were officially her adopted kids, she would use them and abuse them in every way imaginable. And unfortunately, this went on for years. So first of all, Michelle was just overall neglecting the kids. She didn't wash them. She didn't keep them in clean clothing. And for the little ones, she didn't change their diapers frequently. So they would get these very painful rashes. She also did not feed the children properly. They would typically only be fed twice a day and these were not proper meals. These would be like small food items, more like snacks. There was always a ton of food in the house. The fridge and the pantry would be just completely full with snacks and just various food items, you know, cereals, chips, cookies, everything, anything that a kid would ever want. But Michelle would not allow them to eat any of it. They were only allowed to eat if she said they could eat. And so Michelle was only giving them a very small amount of food a couple of times a day. She also did not tend to their medical needs. She didn't take them to the doctor or the dentist. The children started having really bad dental problems because Michelle just wasn't tending to them the way she should. Michelle also disciplined the children in very cruel ways. Michelle had installed locks on the outside of most of the doors in the house. And if the kids misbehaved, she would put them into a room and she would lock them in from the outside. The children would be crying and begging to come out and Michelle would just leave them in there for hours. She also routinely beat the children when they misbehaved and she didn't give them attention or love. These were children who had been through so much in their lives already. Some of them had come from a very traumatic past. They had a very traumatic start in life, but they had been taken from one terrible situation and placed in another. In 2012, Michelle decided to try her hand at becoming a content creator right here on YouTube. This was around that time that a lot of family channels started to pop up on YouTube and Michelle wanted in. She saw how lucrative a family channel could be. Those types of family channels can usually pull in a lot of money. They tend to get larger brand deals. They are advertiser friendly because their content is geared towards kids. So they're also making more in ad revenue. Some family channels pull in millions per year and Michelle saw her opportunity to get in on the action. So in 2012, Michelle launched the Fantastic Adventure YouTube channel. And just like the name implies, the content would involve the kids going on various adventures. Everything in these videos was 100% scripted. This was not like a family vlogging style channel. She wasn't candidly filming like what her kids did that day. These were like scripted adventures where the kids would pretend to be like superheroes. There was Fortnite style content where they would do, you know, like Fortnite adventures. Some episodes would be a little scarier, like where they would be running from robbers or werewolves. And guess who the bad guys were in all of these episodes? Michelle Hobson's two biological sons, Ryan and Logan Hackney, which is very interesting when you learn more about them later on in the case. Ryan and Logan played a very, very big role in this channel. They obviously acted in the videos, like I said, but they also did a lot of the behind the scenes stuff like filming and editing. And at least one of Michelle's biological daughters also acted in the videos as well. Her daughter, Megan, would appear in some of the videos and she also 
also had a hand in like the merch part of the channel. And this channel started to grow pretty quickly. And Michelle was landing some large brand deals with various companies and she was raking in the money. And the kids that were tuning in, they loved this content. The Fantastic Adventures became a household name for hundreds of thousands of families. Kids were tuning in every week to watch the Hobson kids go on these epic adventures together. They would have Nerf gun fights. They would have snowball fights in the house. They would do like kids versus adults challenges and all of these fun things. And it looked like these kids were living this amazing life. But of course we know that behind the scenes, it was anything but amazing. And the abuse and the neglect just escalated to an unimaginable level. As the channel grew, Michelle seemed to become more and more unhinged and cruel and sadistic towards her kids. If the kids ever said their lines wrong or didn't perform up to Michelle's standards, they would be severely punished. She would starve the children for days. She would also withhold water for days. The kids would be beaten with belts and metal coat hangers. Michelle would burn their bodies with lighters. They would be beaten in the head with objects. She would also take some of their personal hygiene items and she would send them to school dirty and smelly and with unbrushed teeth. Michelle turned one of the rooms in the house into a green room and it just looked like a large closet that they had painted green. There were no windows. There was no furniture. It was literally just a small green room with tile floors and it was right next to Michelle's bedroom. And if the children ever misbehaved or they didn't perform the way she thought they should, multiple kids would be locked inside of that green room for days. They would have to sleep on the cold, hard tile floor with no pillow and no blanket. And Michelle wouldn't even let them out to go to the bathroom. She would make them strip down and put on a pull up and then she would lock them inside. And the children would start to lose track of time because there were no windows. They couldn't see what time of day it was. There was one single light source in the green room and it was just an overhead light on the ceiling, but Michelle would even unscrew the light bulb so the children would have no light at all. So they would just be sitting in total darkness for hours or even days, sleeping on the cold, hard floor, forced to sit in their own waste. And the kids would hear Michelle moving around in the house and they would just be begging her to let them out, but she would just ignore them. As the channel really started to take off, Michelle decided to pull her kids from public school and homeschool them herself. She did not actually teach them anything. They never did homework. They never had lessons. Their sole focus was their YouTube channel. That's all Michelle cared about at this point. They had absolutely no life outside of the Fantastic Adventures YouTube channel. The neighbors later reported that they never saw the kids outside unless they were filming. Yeah, but those little kids, the only time I ever saw them out was getting out of their car, going in their house or in the back when they were shooting their videos. It's shocking, yeah, I had no clue at all. Lisa telling us she once found Hackney's keys. She claimed online she needed them because it was to a locked box for medication. Now it makes me think, was it keys to possibly a locked door where kids were? Makes you really wonder like, what's going on around you. School had been their only escape from this nightmare that they were living at home. And then that was taken away from them too. So now they're either filming or being tortured, abused and starved. That's it, that's all they had. And Michelle didn't just pull them from school to make videos. She also pulled them from school because she was starting to get nervous about all of the allegations of neglect and abuse that kept popping up, which we will talk more about later. And once she had the kids trapped in the house every single day away from the watchful eye of teachers and daycare workers, she upped the abuse even more. She forced the kids to do everything for her. They cooked for her, they cleaned for her, they did everything for her. Michelle also installed cameras around the house so she could keep an eye on the kids at all times. Michelle would just sit all day long, eating, working on YouTube stuff, watching the cameras and chain smoking cigarettes while they did all the work in the house. So like I said, the abuse just got so much worse once the kids were no longer in school. One of Michelle's favorite forms of punishment at this point involved forcing the kids to strip down completely naked, put on a pull up and then stand in the corner with their hands up above their heads for hours. And they weren't allowed to move until they received a beating from Michelle. One of the children said that they were forced to stand there completely naked in the corner with their arms up for 18 hours. Michelle really had a thing about forcing the kids to strip down naked. Several of the kids reported having to do that on multiple occasions. One child said that Michelle touched him 
inappropriately. And she would also pinch the boys on their genitals with her fingernails until they started bleeding. But the kids would all say that the worst form of punishment that they received was the pepper spray in the ice baths. Michelle would force the kids to strip down naked and she would spray them all over their bodies with pepper spray. And this includes their genitals. She would put a lot of emphasis on pepper spraying their genitals. And the children were not allowed to wash off the pepper spray for an entire day. She would make them leave it on. And she would also use ice baths as a form of punishment. She would either fill up a bucket with ice water and then dump it on top of the kids, or she would fill up the bathtub with ice water and she would force their heads down into the water until they were like basically drowning. And while all of this horrific abuse is going on behind the scenes, their 800,000 subscribers are being shown this fun, happy little fake world that Michelle Hobson has manufactured. These kids were living a literal nightmare nearly every single day of their lives, but the world saw the exact opposite. Under their channel description, Michelle wrote, we're fantastic adventures. We're a family that's full of unique and special kids. We started making these videos for fun, but fell in love with making them and now do it every week for you guys. And the only time that the children were ever treated like actual human beings, the only time that they were ever shown even like an ounce of care was on filming days. On filming days, they were allowed to go outside. They were allowed to play. They were allowed to have snacks. And I would imagine that this is probably the only time that they ever felt like they were actually making their mother proud. But in the back of their minds, they knew that filming day could end badly. If they forgot their lines, if they didn't perform up to Michelle's standards, they knew they were going to be in trouble. The Fantastic Adventures YouTube channel has been deleted. These videos are no longer available on YouTube. And the only clips that I have seen had the kids' faces blurred out. So I've never seen like the expressions on their faces during these skits. But some people have said that the kids look worried. They looked like they were focusing really hard on delivering those lines perfectly. And of course, we know now that they were terrified. They knew what would happen to them if they didn't do a good job. So like I mentioned earlier, daycare workers and teachers had noticed some concerning things over the years and they reported Michelle to DCS on multiple occasions. And there were actually times that the kids themselves went to an adult and told them about the abuse, but nothing was ever done. In fact, between 2011 and 2019, Michelle had been reported to DCS at least 11 different times. And each and every time the findings came back unsubstantiated. And just prepare yourselves to be really angry. You're already angry with Michelle and her two grown sons who are witnessing the abuse and doing nothing about it, but just get ready to be absolutely infuriated. So the first time Michelle was reported to DCS was in April of 2011. A babysitter for the family became concerned when she witnessed Michelle locking the kids into a bedroom and just leaving them there crying to be let out. She she also told DCS that Michelle didn't properly feed her children. She didn't cook them food. She wasn't providing a healthy atmosphere for them. And she was just overall concerned about the well being of the children. So she reported all of this to DCS, and the findings came back unsubstantiated. The second report came in May of 2013. One of the children got up the courage to tell a teacher that Michelle was forcing her to stand in a corner every day after school for hours and would make her beg for food. A third report was called in just a couple couple of weeks after the second one, one of the girls told a teacher that her mom had taken away her toothbrush as a punishment. And that was why she had gunk on her teeth. Now this teacher had known this child for about three years. And over the course of those three years, she had noticed things here and there. The teacher noticed that the girl was usually sent to school dirty, wearing clothes that didn't properly fit. Just, she seemed overall neglected. And the findings for the second and the third reports were both found to be unsubstantiated. And it was was after that third report that Michelle pulled all of the kids from public school. Michelle even called up the school and spoke to that teacher who reported her and she bragged that the DCS worker who had investigated the claim laughed about it and did nothing. She was literally bragging that the caseworker did not believe the teacher. So do we hate this woman enough yet? Then in August of 2014, a daycare employee called DCS to report that Michelle's kids were quote, unbathed, covered in feces and had infected blisters and rashes all over. In April of 2015, DCS was called again when one of the children told an adult that Michelle had thrown a can of food, which then hit them in the head, and that child had a scar to prove that this did in fact happen. Then in July of 2015, DCS was told that one of the children had, quote, bruising up from her elbow to her forehead. That same report spoke about another child who had bruising and cuts and scrapes on her forehead, arms, face, and head, and she also had a severe diaper 
Koresh. A third child was mentioned in the same report, and it was said that this child was, quote, so hungry, she had 13 ounces of formula and was hoarding food, trying to shove them in her pockets. And every single one of the claims that I have just told you were all investigated by DCS and found to be unsubstantiated. But one of the most infuriating and heartbreaking incidents happened in December of 2017. In December of 2017, one of the boys actually managed to escape. Michelle had been punishing this particular boy that day for having an accident, likely due to Michelle locking him in a room and not allowing him to use the bathroom. And as part of the punishment, Michelle, of course, made the boy completely undress because of the sick fuck that she was. And he had already been beaten at least once that day, but he knew that it wasn't over. He knew Michelle was going to be back. And so he decided that he was going to take a chance. I don't know how he did it, but at some point he found a window of opportunity and he managed to escape the house and he just started running. And I think at this point, you can really see the parallels between this part of the case and the eight passengers case. But unfortunately, escaping the Hobson house did not put an end to the torture like it did with the Ruby Frankie case. So Michelle very quickly realizes that this child has escaped. And so she decided to call 911 and report him as a runaway. She likely did this to throw DCS and police off of her scent, you know, play the part of the concerned mom. And, you know, that way she could ultimately later blame everything on the child. Because remember, all of these children have some sort of documented issue and Michelle's stick was to blame the child every time. It could never be the super mom's fault. It had to be the troubled child telling lies. And the amount of times that that worked for her is just insane. So like I said, Michelle calls 911 and she tells them that her troubled child has run away from home. So the police go out to the neighborhood and they start looking around. They figure he probably couldn't have gone too far. And they pretty quickly find him hiding in a neighbor's backyard. He is completely naked. He is freezing cold. He's shivering and he's obviously terrified. And this child just flat out tells the cops what's happening. He says, I'm being beaten. I'm being starved. I'm being pepper sprayed all over my body, my face, my genitals. He also told them that he never has clean clothes. And he literally starts begging the police not to send him back to Michelle Hobson's home. Keep in mind that this child is completely naked as well. All of the red flags should have been up at this point, but no, the officers take him to the hospital, but they allowed Michelle to come into his room room and be by his side the entire time. An officer named Michael Takagi did speak to the child and to some of the other children. Officer Takagi was told that Michelle kept them out of school so that no one sees their bruises and that she tries to hit them in places where their injuries won't be visible. And so Officer Takagi did call DCS and he reported the issue. However, when that initial 911 call was placed by Michelle, the situation was initially classed as a juvenile issue because she claimed that the child was troubled and he ran away. But based on the claims made by the boy and just the state that he was found in, the juvenile issue should have been changed to a criminal issue. But Officer Takagi never changed it in the system. And because it was never changed in the system, the detectives who would normally investigate these types of child abuse cases, they were never alerted. So a proper investigation was never done by police. And this boy was sent home with Michelle that very same night. He was right back in the home. DCS did finally go out and investigate about six days later. And before they went out to the house, they were told, quote, Hobson locks kids in the closet upstairs in her room for 90% of the day. There is a reverse lock on the door, so they are unable to get out. She only feeds them every two to three days and she takes away their water privileges. She hits them in the head and pulled them out of school. Hobson is reported to no CPS and will brief the children and tell them that she will hurt them if they say anything. But even after all of that, the claim was still found to be unsubstantiated. Once again, Michelle told the same old story. She was the best mom in the universe and these were just troubled kids. And who are you going to believe? Are you going to believe them? Are you going to believe me? And it worked like a charm for her every single time. These children were literally crying out for help. They were bravely speaking up and they were telling people what was happening in the home. But time after time, they were just ignored and forgotten. And you can only imagine how much Michelle tortured those kids after all of these 
these claims, especially after the escape. One child later said that after the police left, she made me stand for hours with my hands up. Another child later said, mom got mad at us and she put us in that room for a really long time. So we all got scared to tell again because that was after the cops came once. Just an absolute failure of the system. The situation in 2017 should have been the final straw. I don't know how much more obvious it was that this woman was a fucking monster, but instead this abuse went on for another year and a half. And all the while, Michelle Hobson is growing her YouTube channel, getting more elaborate with the stories and the special effects, getting better equipment. She's making huge brand deals. She's sending emails to Disney trying to partner with them. That was like her golden goose. She thought that if she could partner with Disney, she would be like YouTube family channel royalty. And by 2019, Michelle was even in the process of buying a house in California so that she and the kids could be closer to Disneyland. She had big plans for the future of fantastic adventures. She was probably thinking about all the fun videos that she could film in Disneyland. But thankfully, Michelle Hobson's reign of terror is approaching an end. So by 2019, both of Michelle's biological daughters had left the home. They hadn't lived there in a couple of years. The boys, Logan and Ryan, still live in the home, but the girls are gone. At least one of the daughters, Megan, would still appear in videos occasionally and she would help with merch. I'm not sure how involved the other daughter was with the channel. I don't know if she was involved at all with the channel, but both of them were pretty far removed from the day-to-day -day life in the house at this point. Well, one day in March of 2019, Michelle asked her daughter, Megan, to take one of the adopted girls to the dentist. Michelle had neglected the kid's teeth for so long that they were starting to rot. So I guess she figured that she really needed to do something about it finally. But of course she couldn't be bothered to take her daughter to the dentist herself. So she asked Megan to do it. But I am so glad that she did ask Megan because it was after that dentist appointment while they were driving back home, the little girl started confiding in her older sister about everything that was happening in the home. Now, from what I gather, it seems like the two biological daughters knew at least some of what was happening and they had actually reported Michelle to DCS themselves. But according to them, as soon as they would submit a claim, someone from DCS would call Michelle to tip her off, tell her that her daughters had reported her and tell them everything that they had said. Every time it happens, they give her a heads up. Okay. They tell her what's happening because she's a part of the foster care system. They interviewed the kids right in front of her. Yeah. right in front of my mother. It seems, in my opinion, that DCS was working with Michelle to keep those kids in the home at all costs. Michelle was willing to take in all of these children that, you know, were maybe a little harder to adopt out and they were just trying to keep them in her home. And so they turned a blind eye to all of this evidence that was right in front of them, in my opinion. But back to that car ride home from the dentist. So the little girl starts talking and she's just letting everything out. She's talking about the abuse, about the pet, pepper spray, the pull-ups, the ice baths, everything. So Megan stops the car, she pulls out her cell phone and she started recording the conversation. Do you go to school? Nope. I'm homeschooled, but I don't even do school homework at home or anything. Doesn't let us do anything at all. She doesn't even let us go play outside. She starved me for five days straight. I threw up one day because of it. She didn't care. She still did not feed me. She makes us sit with the pepper spray on us for a whole entire day straight. She emptied two bottles on me. If we pee ourselves, she doesn't let us have water for at least a whole entire day straight. Last time CPS and cops came, I wanted to tell them the truth, but they wouldn't let, my mom told me to say all lies. And if I didn't say lies, she would have, she threatened me and said she was gonna kill me. Do you think any of the kids should live there? No. I think they're not safe there. So once Megan has this footage of her little sister, she and her other biological sister go straight to the police. And they're like, look, our mom is a monster. She's been reported so many times, but she's always given a heads up by DCS. They never interview the kids alone. She's always in the room. She's managed to escape any charges and our seven siblings are still trapped in this house of horrors. And then they show them the video. And thankfully this time they finally take the claims seriously. It only took eight years, 11 DCS claims, claims a naked runaway child and a video account of the abuse, but someone finally fucking listened. And on the night of March 14th, 2019, Michelle Hobson and Logan and Ryan Hackney got the shock of their lives when Maricopa police showed up at their door. One of the biological sons answered the door and you know, you can tell that he's completely thrown off seeing the officer there. Michelle seems pretty shocked at first too, but then she kind of collects herself and plays it cool. And she sits on a recliner and just acts super unbothered. In my opinion, I think this was
was an act. I personally think that she was silently freaking out because remember, according to her daughters, anytime a report was filed with DCS, she was always immediately warned. So this was totally out of the blue. But either way, she sits down on the recliner and she just tries to act calm and collected. I spanked the child. Like, what? No crime in the house? You're not telling me what was said. No, I'm not going to tell you because there's an investigation. And while an officer is talking to her upstairs, there are other officers downstairs checking out the house and looking for the kids. And the state of this house was disgusting. They had two clean rooms, which were presumably the rooms that they planned to film in, but the rest of the house was filthy. There were piles of clothes and trash, just junk in most of the rooms. Most of the kids did not have beds. They didn't have mattresses. The kids themselves looked very pale. They were very frail and malnourished. They had dark circles under their eyes. There were some kids that were found in pull-ups and these were older children. So it just seemed off to the officers that they should be in pull-ups. And so the officers started conducting these short little interviews with some of the children. And the next clip that I'm about to show you completely broke me. It's just absolutely heartbreaking. So you can see in the body cam footage that the officer is talking to a little girl in the pantry. It's like a walk-in pantry and it's full of food you know, chips, cookies, cereals, tons of stuff. And the officer tells the little girl that she can get herself a snack because he knows that these children are being starved. He knows that she's hungry and they are literally surrounded by food. So he says, you know, get you a snack, grab you something, grab some chips if you want. But this child was terrified. She was so afraid to get a snack because she knew what would happen if Michelle found out. We're gonna protect you. Is there anything in here that you wanna eat right now while we're waiting? It's seriously anything. Look, you got some chips. <laughs> No, she's not. No, she's not. No, she's not. <laughs> you are not going to talk to mom right now. I love you, and I don't even know you. I love you too, because you're saving me from this house. I know, baby. Those kids were so terrified of Michelle Hobson that even just the thought of breaking one of her rules sent them into a panic. But I am happy to finally say that after this little welfare check, Michelle Hobson and Logan and Ryan Hackney were all arrested. The children were brought in to be checked over and for like official, more thorough questioning. The children all had the same story. They talked about the beatings, the pepper spray, the ice baths, all of it. We go to bed. And the next day, the next morning, she won't let us out. Like we asked her and she says no. And one of the detectives said that one of the children drank three bottles of water over the course of only 20 minutes because they had been so deprived of water. Several of the kids were found to have bruising or other injuries on their bodies, including around their necks. And in the end, Michelle was charged with 30 counts of child abuse, kidnapping, and molestation. Logan and Ryan were charged with failure to report, but those charges were ultimately dropped. It was found that even though Logan and Ryan were grown ass men, that they had no obligation to report the abuse that was happening in the house. I don't understand that at all. I truly do not understand how these charges were dropped, but we're not done with Logan and Ryan. They come back up at the very end of this case and let's just say they are also both despicable pieces of shit. Michelle pleaded not guilty, so the case was set to go to trial, but Michelle Hobson actually died on November 12th, 2019, so she didn't live long enough to stand trial. The reports say that she had a head injury while being in jail. Some say that she had a stroke, but she ended up on hospice and she started refusing to eat or take her medication, and so she ultimately died. Michelle had maintained her innocence before her death. She was even recorded during a phone call to her father saying that the kids love filming. They would beg to film these videos. As a matter of fact, I would be like, okay, um, you know, like if you're in trouble next week, you can't, you don't get to be in the videos. And that would be encouraging to them. It's so funny because I read the things and I'm like, are you guys, you guys have no facts here. They just slap a bunch of on paper and then they go, here's your charges. And I raised those kids. So you tell me I'm this horrible, vicious person. Let's go to court and let's play this out because I've got, I've got documentation, they don't. She also was recorded saying that she had a whammy for the state of Arizona. So was this whammy that she was going to try to die before trial? Did she play a role in that head injury? She had stopped eating and medicating. So was she maybe trying to ensure that she would be dead before ever having to serve a sentence? They better figure it out because they're gonna be transporting me to a hospital if they don't. 
I'm not doing well. Michelle always had to have control over everything. So maybe this was like her way of having the ultimate control over her future. She wasn't going to let a jury have the final say. She was going to decide her own fate. Or maybe she just had a stroke and died. I don't know. But either way, Michelle Hobson is dead and that's all that matters. After her death, the charges against Michelle were ultimately dropped. And many people were very upset that she was dead and she would never, you know, really have to face her victims or listen to their accounts and most likely spend several years in prison. But other people pointed out that this was actually a good thing because the children would now not have to testify. They wouldn't have to go through that trauma of seeing Michelle again and having to, you know, give their account in front of a courtroom full of strangers. And as far as the kids go, of course, their identities are protected as they should be. So we don't know exactly where they are today. The last update that I saw, two of the kids went to live with a relative of Michelle's and the other five were placed in new homes. Wherever they are today, Today, I hope that they are doing well. I hope that they can somehow overcome this horrific chapter in their lives. And I hope that they finally have the life that they deserve with families who truly love them. And after this case broke, the question was asked, how did this manage to go on for so long? Adopted, abused, and abandoned. Seven kids placed in the care of Michelle Hobson, who became known as YouTube Mom after her 2019 arrest. The horrors Hobson was accused of shocking not only our state, but the country. And now ABC 15's Zach Crenshaw has uncovered the state was told repeatedly about the abuse and neglect years before her arrest. For nearly a decade, at least seven kids, the Arizona Department of Child Safety was charged with protecting, said they were starved, beaten, burned, pepper sprayed, and pulled from school. We didn't get a single record from DCS, but we got enough from Maricopa Police Reports, going over hundreds of pages and photos, as well as hours of body camera footage that reveal DCS failed to remove the kids, despite nearly a dozen detailed reports. This is as bad of a case without any fatality as I can remember ever reviewing. DCS was now under fire. The Maricopa Police Department was now under fire and things just got worse for them when it was discovered that Michelle had been reported at least 11 times over the years. And that incident in 2017, the one where the boy escaped, completely outraged everyone, which then forced Maricopa Police to do an internal investigation into that situation. It was found that Officer Takagi failed to reclassify the incident as a criminal issue and and Takagi's Lieutenant Mary Turner failed to review the report and to catch the mistake. And do you want to know what their punishment was for causing a nearly two year delay in the arrest of Michelle Hobson? Suspension without pay for 10 hours. That was it. And DCS never really owned up to anything at all. They released a statement and I'm not going to read the entire thing, but I want to at least mention this part. I wish someone would have detected these alleged horrors sooner. No one did, but we know someone did. A lot of people did, like a bunch of people detected the horrors and they were told about it 11 separate times. At DCS, we are committed to protecting children and in some cases, finding them a loving adoptive family. Foster parents, DCS, and all of the aforementioned system partners dedicate their lives to preventing and healing the suffering that comes from human frailties and evil. Can we all do better? Should we aspire to continuously improve? Of course. But these issues are much more complex and require more than just blaming one entity within an entire system of care and community. So no accountability whatsoever. At the very least, an internal investigation should have been conducted within DCS to see who exactly dropped the ball 11 times. To my knowledge, there has never been an internal investigation done. And so that was that. And this brings us to the Logan and Ryan Hackney case that just continues to unfold. So like I said earlier, those charges of failure to report were dropped back in 2019. But in 2023, both Logan and Ryan were arrested for sexual misconduct against minors. Both Logan and Ryan were accused of sexually abusing some of the children who had been fostered by Michelle while they were living in the home. Ryan was charged with two counts of sexual misconduct with a minor between August 1st 2011 and March 1st, 2012. Logan was charged with four counts of sexual misconduct with a minor. His crimes were committed between 2008 and 2012. And all of these victims of both Logan and Ryan were all under the age of 15, with the youngest being only five years old at the time of the assault. Logan and Ryan both pleaded not guilty. And the last bit of information I could find has Ryan bonding out and wearing an ankle monitor to await trial. And Logan hadn't bonded out as of May, 2023. 
and he was still in prison awaiting trial. Their trials were originally set to start in August of 2023, but as far as I can tell, they haven't happened yet. So hopefully I'll have an update for you guys one day soon. Hopefully at the end of the day, someone involved in this horrific case will finally spend some serious time in prison. And that is all I have on this case. Please let me know what you guys think about this one. Had you ever heard of Michelle Hobson or Fantastic Adventures? I'm really surprised that I had never heard of her until recently, especially after the Ruby Frankie case broke. So I wanna know if you knew about this one already and tell me your thoughts and opinions. And don't forget, you can click the link below or go to wildgrain.com summer and use my code summer to get $30 off your first order and free croissants in every wild grain box. And if you find this type of content interesting, please consider subscribing, liking this video and commenting. It's the easiest way for you guys to support me and my channel. And as always, I appreciate each and every one of you for watching. I'm gonna go hug my children now and I will see you next time.